When Titanic was released in 1997, no one was quite sure what to expect. At the time, it was the most expensive film ever made, nearly doubling its original estimated budget and eventually costing the studio $200 million. And with a runtime of 195 minutes, limiting its potential daily screenings, it was almost a guarantee that the film was going to lose money. It was just a matter of how much money. If it weren't for James Cameron's proven track record as a filmmaker with a string of box office successes, he likely would have been shut down long before the film was ever completed. But the studio was ready to take a chance on his vision. A depiction of the ill-fated maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic with a teenage love story at the center. It went on to become the highest grossing film of all time, the first ever to cross a billion dollars in revenue, and remained the highest grossing film until 2009 when James Cameron released his next film, Avatar. And while it did receive a fair amount of criticism, it still went on to win a record 11 Academy Awards, a feat only accomplished by two other films since the Academy's inception in 1929. Basically, by any metric, Titanic was the biggest movie of all time, and represents one of the last great Hollywood epics. But before getting into the rest of today's video, I wanted to take a minute to thank this video's sponsor, the Black Hole Battery Drainer. If you're tired of constantly seeing your phone at full charge, wondering how your battery can possibly power your devices throughout an entire day, the Black Hole Battery Drainer has exactly what you need. Compatible with all battery-powered devices, your power will go from 100 to 0 in seconds, and you can finally turn that fancy smartphone into a useless brick like it was always intended. <laughs> okay, but for real, this video was actually sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> Gotti! <laughs> Gotti! <laughs> We've all seen the ads at this point. They're kind of everywhere to the point that it's become a meme. But you know, it's a free game that's actually really well made and has something for any fantasy RPG fan out there. And having them as a sponsor means that I can actually pay my bills. So for that, I'm eternally grateful. It's obviously not the sort of thing that's for everyone, but given that it's totally free to play for PC or mobile devices, there's no risk in giving it a shot. There are daily login rewards like energy refills, silver, gems, and shards, and a free legendary champion style of the Drake. And if you're new to the game and follow the links in the description, you'll get 100,000 silver and the epic champion Jotun. All of these rewards can be found here. Big boss fights, PvE and PvP action with tons of customizable heroes and all totally free to play. So follow the links in the description to claim your rewards today. All right, back to the video. The scale of the film's production was truly massive, funding an underwater expedition that sent James Cameron and a crew down to the actual Titanic. They built a full-scale replica of half of the ship that was the largest set ever built for a film at the time. They also built dozens of full-scale interior sets that were based on the actual blueprints of the ship, many of which could be tilted and flooded as needed. They built miniatures of individual rooms as well as the Titanic itself that allowed them to show the full ship as it was in 1912 and as it exists today. But as much as they relied on practical effects, they also made use of many groundbreaking CGI techniques like digital doubles or CG face replacement years before they became commonplace. The Titanic was a modern technical marvel the epitome of luxury and sophistication in its day. And for the film to truly work on an emotional level, they had to create a fully realized vision of the ship in its glory. As Cameron puts it, If you didn't appreciate the ship, you couldn't appreciate the sinking. So you had to appreciate it in the terms, in the subjective terms, that people felt about it before they knew they were on the Titanic. It just makes it seem like the idea that you're going to die, that disaster and doom are, are coming, are so far away and so impossible to conceive. And if you don't start from that place, you'll never understand what it was like to be on, the, to be on that ship. So the question was, how do we do it? Where do we start? An exhaustive research process that involved a Russian submersible crew diving to the bottom of the Atlantic, consulting with multiple Titanic historians, and poring over countless historical evidence from witness testimony to old photographs or newspapers, allowed them to recreate this iconic piece of history exactly as it was when it set sail a hundred years prior, right down to the carpet. Every prop had to be made. Cutlery had to be found of the right design, glassware, tableware, everything. The carpet in the dining room all came from the original manufacturer of BMPK Stoddart. 
they still had the old designs and uh, you know they it was all specially woven for us. This level of attention to detail went beyond just the construction of the ship but even extended to the depiction of its passengers, many of whom were based on real people that were known to have been on the ship, casting actors specifically for their likeness to their real life counterparts and when it came to the sinking they studied the forensic science of the shipwreck and even did some experiments of their own to make sure that it was portrayed exactly as it happened, at least to the best of their ability based on the current science. But all of this would have amounted essentially to a $200 million History Channel special if it weren't for Cameron's story at the center, and what separates Titanic from your run-of-the-mill disaster film. Say what you will about some of the film's cheesier moments or dialogue that feels out of place for the time, there's a lot of subtext enriching the story beyond what you would expect from the standard tentpole movie of the mid to late 90s. It's a commentary on the nature of class inequality, gender roles, the dangers of ego and greed, our relationship with technology, as well as serving to remind us that life is short and we shouldn't let it go to waste. I figure life's a gift and I don't intend on wasting it. To make each day count. Well said, Jack. To making it count. To make it count. count. <laughs> By putting a fictional love story in the middle of this very real tragedy, Cameron gives the audience a direct line of empathy to this moment in history. If you do a breakdown of the film's runtime, the first 21 minutes are dedicated to opening titles and the present day story with Brock Lovett and crew searching for the heart of the ocean. The next hour and 20 minutes, nearly a feature length film in and of itself, is dedicated to Jack and Rose, from their arrival to the Titanic, to their first meeting, early flirtations, and eventual blossoming romance we get a full three-act structure of just their love story, with a clear beginning, middle, and end, with Rose planning to run away with Jack and start a life together. When the ship docks, I'm getting off with you. This is crazy. <laughs> I know. It doesn't make any sense. That's why I trust it. You take out that first 20 minutes and cut the film there, and you've got a complete romantic film, and a good one at that, but we've just reached the halfway point. The rest of the film is essentially a full stop disaster film, much in the same vein as The Towering Inferno or The Poseidon Adventure, but because we've spent so much time with these characters that we've come to love, the stakes feel so much higher than your average disaster flick. We actually care about what happens to them. We want to see them and everyone else make it safely to the lifeboats even though we know they won't. We know that some will get killed in the ensuing panic, crushed under the weight of this sinking titan, trapped with nowhere to go as the water gets higher, or die simply from the cold of the open ocean. People once full of life, dreaming of a new start in the new world, killed before their time, their final moments consumed with fear, totally helpless to prevent their fate. It's a horrific sight, and Cameron doesn't pull any punches. There are no pauses for levity. He lets the sense of terror and panic permeate every scene. And suddenly, these sweeping camera movements that once captured the grandeur of the ship and Jack with his boundless optimism now gives us an omnipotent perspective over all of the carnage, helplessly watching as thousands face certain death. We witness acts of courage and acts of cowardice, of love and sacrifice, and we view it all through the lens of two characters we've grown to care for a great deal, with a complete tonal shift from what we saw in the first half of the film that not only creates a proxy for the audience audience to empathize with the larger tapestry of what's happening, but this genre blending makes the characters feel like they've entered into a story they don't belong in. That's how I think all people must feel when caught up in such horrific circumstances. Before the story of the Titanic became legend, these people thought they were taking the vacation of a lifetime on the greatest ship ever built. They were told it was unsinkable, and they would arrive at port in America in record time. None of them were thinking they were headed towards their own deaths, they were just living their lives as normal until one day, or even one moment, changed everything. You'll hear people complain that they both could have fit on the door, or maybe they should have just taken turns. Whatever the case may be, there had to be some way for Jack to survive. But that's missing the whole point. Jack and Rose are the empathetic heart of the story. 
our personal window into this tragedy, and killing Jack forces the audience to feel the full weight of what happened on that day. Because it's difficult to empathize with the past. There's something about looking at old photographs or reading through a history book that just makes it all feel separate from our own lives. It's hard to imagine the people in those old photos as real people with the same complex emotions as ourselves, but they all had mothers and fathers, friends and lovers, hopes and dreams and fears, and Cameron wanted us to feel the weight of all that was lost. More than 1,500 people lost their lives that day. Each and every one of those passengers and crew had a life, they had a story, they had a family. Stories like Titanic, both Cameron's fictionalized retelling and the historical event itself, remind us of how fragile life really is, and how important it is to make the most of your life while it's still yours to live. And despite the tragedy surrounding Rose, the silver lining of it all is that she doesn't waste it. She makes good on her promise to Jack to never let go of the hope and the optimism that he instilled in her, and goes on to live a life of adventure and love and dies peacefully in her sleep. I think this is why Titanic became the biggest movie of all time. It offered the best spectacle that money could buy, competing with any other of the best in escapist entertainment, but it also offered something more. Titanic hits everyone on some level because it truly has a little bit of everything. History, action, romance, humor, tragedy, and it captures the best and worst of the human condition, ending with an inspirational message to live your life to the absolute fullest.